In my opinion, it was one of the coolest looking aircraft to fly with the RCAF, although no pilot ever actually flew it. It held the distinction of being the first unmanned aerial vehicle to enter service with the Canadian military. It was the Ryan KDA-4 Firebeat, Remote Controlled Missile Bait. The Firebee was a target drone born out of the end of the Second World War. The world at the time was changing rapidly. The incredible pace of technological progress that began with the war continued, if not increased, after it was over. Jet engines, swept wings, missiles, supersonic speeds, and nuclear weapons were all changing the defense landscape, and countries around the world struggled to keep up. Of keen interest was the development of surface-to-air and air-to-air missiles to counter enemy air power. Advancements in electronics allowed for the miniaturization of the necessary navigation and flight control systems. First-generation surface-to-air missiles like the American Lark and Nike Ajax, the Soviet S-25 Berkut, the British Breakmine and Bloodhound, and the Swiss RSA all needed something to shoot at during tests. Unsurprisingly, there weren't many pilots volunteering for this role, and so unmanned platforms needed to be developed. Air-to-air -air weaponry was also advancing, and needed testing against flying targets. New aircraft equipped with radars and 70mm folding fin rockets were coming online, along with the first generation of air-to-air -air missiles. Crews needed practice engaging real aerial targets, and engineers needed data to refine their designs. Companies all over the world began building drones. In the United States alone, over 80 companies submitted proposals ranging from slow propeller craft up to transonic jets. Dozens would be built and tested, but one design stood out from the rest. Created by the Ryan Aeronautical Company in San Diego, California, the prototype Firebee, called the XQ-2, took its first flight in 1951, and it was just what the Americans were looking for. Although fairly small with a wingspan of 3.93 meters and a length of 6.7 meters, it could reach speeds of 1,000 kilometers per hour at 15,000 meters altitude. It had a single Continental J69T-29A turbojet, putting out 7.6 kilonewtons of thrust. The drone was capable of flight times of around 75 minutes, plenty of time to maneuver the drone into position to be intercepted, or recovered if it survived. Fuel tanks, radar reflectors, cameras, or specialized telemetry equipment could be mounted on the wingtips, depending on the needs of the mission. The United States Air Force was the first to order it and by 1952 it was fully operational. They called theirs the Q2A, and was initially equipped with the Continental J69T19B turbojet engine. This was subsequently upgraded with more powerful engines, allowing greater altitude performance. The United States Navy also got involved. Their version of the Firebee, called the KDA-1, was more or less the same as the Q2A, but used a Fairchild J44R20B turbojet instead of the Continental. This was progressively upgraded to the KDA-4 standard through improvements in engine performance and avionics. The Navy version can be recognized by the inlet center body of its engine. Both the United States Navy and Air Force primarily air-launched their Firebees from old World War II bomber aircraft like the B-17, B-29, and B-25. The United States Army, by contrast, deployed a ground launch version of the Firebee that used rocket boosters to get airborne. Canada became involved with the Firebee starting in 1957. At the time, Canada was in need of aerial targets for pilot training on the CF-100 Canuck and testing of the new Sparrow II missile being developed by Canadair. The Firebee was perfect for the job and Canada became its first customer outside of the US. At the time, Canada had an ambitious weapons development program. The semi-active radar-guided Velvet Glove missile, developed by CARD, was cancelled in 1956. Although a decent missile for its time, it was superseded by the much more advanced Sparrow II, which used an active radar seeker. The Sparrow was better suited to the flight regime of the upcoming Avro Aero, which began development around 1955. The Aero-Sparrow combination was seen by the RCAF brass as the future of air combat in Canada, supplanting the existing Sabre and Canuck fleets. To support this, aerial targets were needed. Canada acquired 30 KDA-4 Firebees, the same variant used by the US Navy. 
These were first subjected to cold weather testing in Fort Churchill, Manitoba, before entering service with the RCAF. Crew training was carried out at the China Lake Naval Air Test Facility in California before regular operations began with Cold Lake, Alberta. In order to air launch the Fire Bees, two Lancaster Mark 10s were reactivated from storage in Alberta and sent to ferry aviation. There, they were modified to the Mark 10 drone controller, or 10DC standard, by fitting them with two outboard underwing pylons. Unnecessary equipment was removed and the drone controller wiring and hardware was installed. This allowed control of the drones at ranges up to 240 kilometers and altitudes between 4,250 meters and 15,250 meters. Because of this, visual tracking was impossible, so progress was tracked by a ground radar and plotted on a map. These drone motherships were ready by late 1956 and began operating out of a special facility at RCAF Station Cold Lake, Alberta. A normal mission would go something like this. First, the drone was prepared and any needed equipment was fitted. It was then fueled and mounted to the wing of the Lancaster. The Lancaster would take off and climb up to its launching height over the test range. Upon releasing the drone, the Lancaster would turn away from the range and begin remote control. The Fire Bee would then normally climb to an altitude of around 10,000 meters and begin a planned series of maneuvers. Interceptor aircraft would then track it, engage it, and unlike any other RCAF aircraft, hopefully destroy it. However, it was expected that most flights would not end in flames. Often, the tracking process was the focus of the mission. This meant the Fire Bees could be recovered and reused. Surviving Fire Bees were directed towards recovery areas using any remaining fuel. There, the engine was cut and a drogue recovery parachute was deployed. When it got closer to the ground, a larger parachute was deployed to safely land it on the ground, or in a lake. An H-34 helicopter was used to pick up the drone and fly it back to base. There it could be refitted for use again. It was found that the fire bees could be reused up to 15 times while in service with the RCAF. The fire bees were used to train CF-100 Canuck and CL-13 Sabre crews on aerial interception testing of the Sparrow II missile, and in cooperation with American test programs. The test programs included the American-developed Sparrow III air-to-air -air missile and the Nike Hercules surface-to-air missile. In 1959, the Avro era was cancelled, along with the Arenda Iroquois engines and the Sparrow II missile. With this, the need for the Fire Bees dropped off sharply. By 1961, all the Fire Bees in RCAF service had been retired without replacement. The KDA-4 Fire Bee holds the distinction of being the first unmanned aerial vehicle operated by the RCAF, although it would be far from the last. Today the Fire Bees have been mostly forgotten in the minds of Canadians, but its legacy quietly lives on in today's drones. I want to thank my Patreon supporters for all their support, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, it really helps the channel.